techniques of differentiation. We're going to start off nice and simple. I want to talk about the derivative of any horizontal line, firstly. I have to start there, and then we'll move on from that. Okay, so what happens if I try to find the slope of a constant? So for instance, uh, slope of a constant, when you graph a constant, what do you get? Do you get a horizontal or a vertical line? Which one? If you graph a constant, y equals 5, what do you get? It's not vertical, right? That would be x equals this horizontal line at whatever your constant happens to be. So that's a constant line. Tell me something. Supposing I've drawn this perfectly, what's the slope of my line there? Zero. Sure, because we know the slope of any horizontal line would be zero, right? So, and the slope of a constant is, in fact, <coughs> it's not rising or falling. All right, cool. Uh, well, wait a second, though. What does derivative stand for? Slope, slope of the curve. In our case, our curve is a horizontal line. It's still considered a curve, even though, ironically, it doesn't curve. <coughs> all right? uh, still, though, if derivative means slope, you believe me that derivative means slope, right? If derivative means slope of a function, and the slope of our function is always zero no matter what, then the derivative of a constant, I've been completely general about this constant. I don't know what it is. It could be negative, positive, whatever. What's the derivative of a constant? Basically, it's asking this question. Don't forget what a derivative means. Derivative means slope. What's the slope of a constant line? Zero. Zero, sure. What's the slope of a horizontal line? Zero. The derivative of any constant is zero, no matter what. That's kind of nice. Do you believe that? Do you buy into what the reasoning why? Horizontal lines have no slope, right? or they have a slope of zero, I should say. They have a slope of zero. Therefore, the derivative of a horizontal line must give you zero. Derivative is slope. Slope of horizontal lines are zero. Uh, constants give you horizontal lines, so the derivative of a constant is zero. That's kind of nice. So in English, this says the derivative of a constant is zero. Okay, basic examples just to make sure that you get it. Uh, right, okay, we'll get there in a minute. What's the derivative of... What's the derivative of 3? Three? 3 is a constant. What's the derivative of a constant? Zero. No work at all. That's fantastic. I love it. No more limit, right? If you have a constant, the, the derivative is, is just 0. That's, that's easier. What's the derivative of... Derivative of negative 1, everybody. What is that? Zero. No thought at all. Derivative of constant is 0. What's the derivative <coughs> of zero. pi? Zero. Is pi a constant? Yes. Pi is just a number. It is 3.14159 and forever, whatever that is. But it doesn't matter that it doesn't end. It's still a constant number, isn't it? It doesn't change. The derivative of any constant is 0. So this is 0. How many people feel okay with the derivative of a constant is 0? Good. That's kind of nice, right? We, we didn't even have to use limits over there. Unfortunately for us, when we come up with something that does have a variable in it, there was a formula that we were able to use. We knew that the first derivative, or I'll use, just so you get familiar with it, the derivative of f with respect to x, that's what that is, <coughs> was what? What did it start with? The formula to find a derivative. Oh, no. oh, before that. Limit. 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 Need a limit. Okay. Cool. Minus H. Love it. Okay, that's how you find the derivative. True? We, we practice a lot of time on this. This will, uh, One of the examples we got to do is this one. I want you to see what happens with this. Okay? So we're going to work this through right now. I've asked you to find F plus H. I'm sorry, uh, f of x plus h first, and f of x. Find them independently, then we plug them in and we figure out what this is. 
is going to be, what is f of x plus h? What's that going to give us in this case? Very good. It's just a composition. We're just substituting that in. Have you gotten pretty good at that so far? Yeah. Just don't separate the x plus h, you'll be fine. f of x is just x cubed. So we know our first derivative is going to be limit h goes to 0, x plus h cubed minus x cubed all over h. Still alright so far? What do I do now? Yeah, we've we gone through this a lot. Now it's basically just algebra. You distribute, you combine some like terms, hopefully you're able to factor an h out, and your whole goal here is to cross h's out. True? That, that's your whole, whole goal. So in our case, we'd go, all right, well, this is limit h goes to 0. We've got x cubed plus 3x squared h plus 3xh squared minus, I'm sorry, plus h cubed minus x cubed. I did that kind of fast, but you would just distribute that all out. Uh, x plus h times x plus h times <coughs> x plus h. Distribute combined like terms, and I guarantee that's what you're going to get right there. If you want to learn a quicker way to do that, you come and see me. I'll show you Pascal's triangle and how to do binomial expansion. It's not hard. So far, so good? Does everything except for the h terms cross out? In that case, that's just this one and this one. So we get limit h goes to 0, 3x squared h plus 3x h squared plus h cubed over h. What would I do now to so finish off this problem? Perfect. You're still with me, right? We've done work like this before, just some, some algebra. Cross the h's out. Uh, let the h go to zero because now you've gotten rid of that denominator. And what are you going to get out of this whole beautiful thing? Three x squared. Right? Beautiful. What did I just find? Yeah, sure. This gives the slope of this function, this s-curve, at any point, right? If I had to give you a point like uh, 1, 1, or I give you a point like 2, 8, and you could plug in the 2 or the, the x value, you could evaluate it, find me the actual slope, and find me the equation of the tangent line of that specific point. Could you not? I hope you're like, yes, I can do that right now. That, that's where you should be at this point. Here's the thing. This is going to be from someone who hasn't taken calculus before I want an answer. Do you see, because I know some of you have, and so those of you don't love me that much, but the, those of you who have not had calculus before, you're going to love me. You'll love me. Does this suck? Yes. Yeah. It sucks. I want you to think, is there a way that you can go from here to here without garbage? Do you see a pattern? Do you see the pattern on someone who hasn't had the calculus before? Where's this, where's this number go? Coefficient. What happens to this number? So from this to this, all that happened was this number went out into the front, right? And one got taken away from that number. You believe me? Guess what? Works all the time. <laughs> all the time. Do you ever have to do this again? Why do you think I teach you this one before I teach you this one? Because you won't ever do this. Yeah, you don't have to. This is the, the formula for a derivative. What we're going to learn now are shortcuts. This is horrible. Why is there even a formula when you can just do that? Because this is what we're doing. This is the slope, and this is the only way that you can let the, the points, the distance between them go to zero. This is it. This right here is a shortcut that works every time. Uh, that, so what's the actual calculus? This is the actual calculus. That's it. Right? This is the stuff that works. The limit is the fundamental of the, of the calculus. That's how you let it happen. Now, techniques of differentiation says, great, we understand that. What's the way we can put this in practice and actually do the derivatives all the time? This stuff, right? Because here's the thing. Ah. 
You're going to want to do that? That has to be a 30. You want to do that? No, no I don't either. Because, <laughs> But the, the thing that's going to happen is, it's a polynomial, right? It's a very basic polynomial. <coughs> What's going to happen is if you do binomial expansion, every single term in here, think about this. You can think about it. Every term in here is going to have an H except for the very first one. True? The very first one is not. And you're subtracting exactly that function from it. So that's going to be gone. Everything else has an H. The very next term will have only a single H. That's binomial expansion. When you factor that H out, it, you'll be only left with this thing. Binomial expansion says how you get this is that goes there and that becomes one less. That's why this works. That is the, the power rule for derivatives. So what's calculus? This is calculus. What's the easy way to do it? That's the easy way to do it. You have to know this because that's what we're the, what this class is all about. All right? You're finding slopes and that's how you do it. And practical application though, you just kind of cheat a little bit. You ready to learn how to cheat? Yes. That's what I love to this. I love cheating. It's not cheating. Everyone does this. If everyone does it, it makes it okay. That's not true. But <laughs> <laughs> really? Really? Yeah. No. So if everybody jumps off the bridge. <laughs> Please do it. We have a shortage of food. I mean, it would be... I'm just kidding. Hey, you two on, on YouTube or where? Don't talk about bridges. That's sarcasm hurts sometimes. It does. <laughs> you just hope that sarcasm is not you. Uh, okay, if n is any integer, this works. We're going to find it later, and there's no qualifications on n. It can be anything, but for right now, any integer works for us. This is a true statement. The derivative of any x to any power is equal to. Notice ddx stands for derivative. That's how I'm going to be writing most derivatives in here, because it's very nice notationally to, to write it this way. Uh, it's hard to write it with the f prime to, to do this. Um, I, I don't like that. I like this way to say I'm taking the derivative of whatever's in there. Do you understand? It says take the derivative of this. What you get out of that is what happens to the, the well it wasn't a 30 anymore, was it? it was 3. What happens to the 3? What is a symbol that represents the 3 here? What's the n going to do? You just pull that n out front. The x doesn't change. But what happens to the variable? Sure, you subtract one from it, that's n minus one. Do you love me? I told you you love me. Maybe not, not yet. You're going to. So can you do, we've actually done that derivative before, if you remember. We've done it twice. We've done it the long way, both with limits. Can you do that derivative? What's the derivative of x squared? That's what this question asks. Derivative of x, x squared, what do you do? What happens to the 2 again? It fits this format. So 2 goes here, x to the how much? 1. Because you're going to do 2 minus 1. Now I'm rarely going to show you that math. We're just going to assume you can subtract 1 on your own and get 2x to the first power, or just 2x. Hey, that's kind of cool because you've just found the slope of that curve in less than a, two seconds without doing any limits or anything like that, right? So I could ask you this question and now the same exact question I gave you on your test and you could do it in like a minute, maybe less. Because I say, find me the equation of the tangent line through this curve at the point 2 comma 4. Can you do it? Yeah, at 2 comma 4, here's your slope, right? Plug in 2, you get a slope of 4. Now you have a point and you have a slope, it's very quick. Very, very nice. So on the test, are you ever going to tell us to do that? Yeah, probably once, to make sure you can do it. Yeah, but after that, no, it takes way too long, especially for, for things like this. I mean, honestly, that's just ridiculous. Even though it's very simple, that's ridiculous when it comes to this stuff. You don't want to expand that. You don't want to do that. I'm guessing a whole lot of you are probably not going to come to me for binomial expansion anymore since you don't have to do those for crazy big numbers. Can you take the derivative of x to the fifth? How much is it? To the one. Good. We bring down the five. x to the, subtract one from that exponent, you get to the fourth power. That's the derivative. Very nice, very quick. If you did it this way, would it work out? Yes, absolutely. It's just going to take you a whole long time.
here's one you definitely don't want to do. DDS of s to the 15th. Notice one thing on the notation. Do you notice how this has to change with the variable that I have? Yeah. So it's not ddx anymore, it's dds, derivative with respect to s, and then I'll give you the variable, so s to the 15th. Uh, what's this one? Sure, very quick, very, very fast. Now there are a couple things that we, we should be able to do as well. What would happen if I gave you, did the shiny just wear off the calculus? Did it make it less cool somehow, that it's easier? Or did it make it like awesome, this is so not bad. It's going to get worse. I mean, it's, it's going to get worse. <laughs> <laughs> this is the complication. This yeah. is the calm before the storm. Yeah, this is like the eye of the hurricane, all right? You made it through the outskirts, and now you're like, ah, it's sunny. I like this. A little mist, maybe, to cool you off, and then I pound you again. Later. But for right now, take a breath. Can you do it with negatives? Yeah. Of course. Yes, absolutely you can. What do you do with the, the negative? What's it, what's it going to become? What's the derivative of x to the... By the way, this is showing you work, all right? You don't have to show me any more work than this. What's the derivative of x to the negative third? What happens to the negative three? So you still have to do that. Negative three. X to the... Wait, wait, not negative two. <coughs> negative three minus one, yeah, that's negative four. So this is negative three x to the negative four. You'd be surprised how many people mess that up, all right? Watch your signs very carefully. If you're subtracting, make sure you actually are subtracting. Um, we'll, do, we'll do a couple more. How about this? Do you want us to write out like that or move the exponent to the denominator? Oh, you can do this as well. Generally, generally, I'll tell you, if I've given it to you this way, leave it this way. That's fine. If I've given it to you as the other way, give it to me the other way. Okay. That's the general rule. If you want to write like this all the time, that's fine as well. How about that one? What's that going to be? Negative 2. Negative 2 comes down. Great. P to the what? Oops. Okay. You know what, I'm going to move this one over there so you see it better. This is kind of an important one, actually. What about ddx 1 over x? Is it 1 over x, uh, sorry, 1 over what do you do with that? Is it 1 over 1? You just take the derivative of x. Can you do that? Move the exponent in front of x, which is 1 up to the top. Uh -huh. Make it a negative exponent. So we have to move this so that it fits that format. Are you with me? Right now it doesn't. So somehow you got to change it to make it fit that. If we do that, sure, now it becomes a negative 1. Now you can take the derivative because it fits our x to the n format. We'll bring down the negative 1. x to the what? 2. 2 or negative 2? You're subtracting 1 from it. Negative 2. And then because I gave it this way, change it back. We're going to have negative 1 over x squared. That's the derivative. You okay with this so far? By the way, what's the derivative <coughs> of just x? One. Some people said x, some people said one. More than one. What's the exponent right now? One. It is one, right? So what would happen here is you'd bring down the one, you'd have x to the one minus one, wouldn't you? What's x to the one minus one? Zero. So you'd have one times x to the zero. What's x to the zero? One. So this is 1 times 1, or 1. The derivative of x is 1. In fact, if you think about this, think. Think for a second. Understand that's the most basic of all linear equations, yes? What, what, where we have a non-horizontal. It's x to the first power. What's the slope of this line? One. Derivative means slope, doesn't it? So the derivative would also be 1. That's, you can show it with the general power rule now. 
How many will feel okay with so far with like this? All right, another little thing we can do. It's kind of cool. This opens up a whole lot of doors for us. So, another note. If you ever have a constant times a function, that could be anything in there. What we can do with derivatives is take that constant and move it up in front of our derivative. It doesn't apply to it. So this is the same thing as c times the derivative of f of x. If c is a constant. So for make sure you, you know that c is a constant number. It doesn't change as a number like 3 or negative 2 or pi. But if we have it being multiplied by that function, we can pull outside. We'll take see a couple examples of this. How about the derivative of 5x to the fourth power? Do I have a constant in there being multiplied by a function? Yeah, 5 is being multiplied by x to the fourth. Remember, we, we kind of want to make it fit that thing, right? Because that's, oh, that's the only thing we know right now. So that's about it. So you know you can make this 5 times the derivative of x to the fourth. We can take that constant number and multiply it by the, the derivative of the function itself. So what's the derivative of x to the fourth power, please? Four. Don't forget about the 5. But then you have 4x, sure, to the third power. Now you can do the 5 times 4. How much are you going to get? 20. Yeah, sure. Now, look. Practically, can you get 20x to the third from here? Yeah. Absolutely. You bring down the 4, you multiply it times the 5, you're going to get the 20, right? Are you following me on that? <laughs> I haven't out outpaced you yet? No. All right, cool. If you bring down the 4, which you know you're going to be doing, multiply it by the constant term, you're going to get the 20, and then subtract 1 from the 4. You're still going to get 20x to the third power. How about the derivative of negative x to the seventh power? What do you think? What can we do? Do we have a constant in there? Yes. So we could pull that constant out of that negative, then take the derivative of x to the seventh. Can you take the derivative of x to the seventh? Yeah. All of you should be able to at this point, right? So we can do that, but basically I'm showing this to let you know that if we can pull the constant outside of it, you can just multiply it by the exponent. So in our case right here, can you tell me the answer with just doing negative, the, the derivative of negative x to the seventh? What are we going to get? Sure. You know that's a constant. You'll be multiplying it later. Negative 1, that's a negative 1, times positive 7, that's negative 7, x to the sixth power, and you're done. That's your derivative there. How about, let's do one last one. The derivative of pi over x squared. Pi over x squared. What do you think? Is it pi over 2x? Pi over 2x. Can you do that? Can you do pi over 2x? That doesn't fit, right? That doesn't fit the, the power rule that I gave you just a minute ago. It doesn't fit that. What would you have to do to the x squared before you can do that stuff? Just what you did here. Put it in. Same thing you did that. You've got to make it this format, otherwise you can't touch it. So right here we've got to say, all right, well, I know that this is the same thing as d dx pi x to the negative 2. Are you with me on that? Or no? Move your, negative, move your exponents up, make them negative. That way you can use that power rule that I showed you, otherwise you can't do it. This in no way is equal to pi over 2x. You can't just, can't do that. <clears throat> Now, what, what's next? What do you think? Pull out your pi. We could pull out the pi if you wanted to, or you could leave it in there if you wanted to. It doesn't really matter. If you pull out the pi, you'll have pi times d dx of x to the negative 2. 
Now can you take the derivative of x to the negative 2? Yeah, now it fits, right? Now you can do it. You can pull down the negative 2, take 1 away from that exponent. You're going to get the negative 2x to the negative 3, and then multiply by the pi. By the way, stop for a second. You know how I told you the derivative of a constant <coughs> is always 0? A lot of people ask later, well, wait, wait a second. If the derivative of a constant is always 0, why don't we get a 0 here? Why don't we do that? Well, that's actually connected to something with a variable, right? If you have a constant by itself, like the derivative of pi, that was 0. However, because we have a, a constant being connected to that, that variable, we can pull that outside by multiplication. So basically it just hangs around and says, no, it's not 0. Uh, I will show you that, yes, a derivative of the constant, it is 0. Uh, but if you did that, you'd have to show something called the product rule here. I'll talk about that in the next section. But for right now, you go, okay, well, wait. A derivative of a constant by itself. Yes, zero. As soon as you connect it to a variable, that now is just a <coughs> constant being multiplied by that variable. You can pull it out front, you can use that rule that I showed you, then take the derivative of the function and multiply it back. Does that make sense? Otherwise, all of your derivatives would end up being zero. And that would say, I can say the slope of everything is zero. That's not true. <laughs> so here you have the pi times, well, y'all told me it was negative two, <coughs> x to negative three. We bring it down, we subtract one. And if you really wanted to kind of pretty this thing up a little bit, you'd make it negative 2 pi over x cubed. Do you see how to get to the negative 2 pi over x cubed? Nod your head if you can. You feel all right with that? Okay, and that's our derivative. Could you have got there directly from, from here? Sure, sure. You bring down that negative 2, that's the negative 2 times pi. x to the negative 3, you can do that. By the way, a couple of nice little little rules for us. Just like we could do with limits, you see, when we're finding derivatives, we're actually finding limits, right? With limits, you can pull constants out. With limits, you can separate by addition and subtraction, true? You can do the same thing here. If you have the derivative of a couple functions being added or subtracted, that's the same thing as a derivative of the first function, plus or minus for use and subtraction, the derivative of the second function. You ready to see how we can apply this to some problems? Okay, now, now check this out. By the way, this should be like a booyah moment for you. Like, yes! Well, I got this. No more limits. Bam! Because if you had to do, oh my gosh, if you had to do this problem, with limits, see you all next week. I'll go home for, for four days and you can just work on that. Well, it would take a week. But it'd be pretty difficult, wouldn't it? Because remember what you'd have to do to find the derivative. You'd have x plus h and x plus h in here and subtract that whole thing, you'd have to find some common denominators because you have this, uh, this negative exponent. You have some pretty nasty work to do on this thing, very nasty work. However, using what we now know about derivatives, if we can break all this stuff up into individual functions being added or subtracted, take the derivative of each one and put them back together, we're good to go. I mean, that's not bad at all. So can I separate these two things? Okay, let's go slowly through this. I really want you to get this. Yeah, you can. You can separate addition and subtraction. So this is the same thing as the derivative of 3x to the ninth minus the derivative of x to the negative 3. Are you okay on that step? Tell me one thing you could do with this. Is that legal to do? Can you pull the constant out? Yes. We could do that. The constant doesn't become a zero. It's connected by that variable. Could you just take the derivative the way it is? Okay, let's, let's try that. What's the derivative of 3x to the 9th, everybody? What is it? Good. Bring it down, you're multiplying that. 3 times 9 gives you the 27. x to the 8th, sure, we're subtracting one from the exponent. Then I have my minus sign. What's the derivative of this one? Negative 3x. Positive 3? 
Okay, it's going to be ultimately, yes, you're right. But since I have this minus sign right here, what's the derivative of just that piece? X to what? Good, I'm subtracting one. Remember, that's in parentheses because I'm subtracting that whole derivative there. Minus a negative becomes a? Does that look okay to you? Hey, quick question. Could you get there directly from here? Sure. What's the derivative of 3x to the 9th? It is 27x to the 8th. Minus the derivative of 3x to the negative 3. Negative times a negative gives you a positive 3x to the negative 4. Can you get that on your own as well? Sure you can. What I'm letting you do here is I'm, I'm showing you, sure, you can do this. It's legal. Therefore, what that allows you to do in your calculus is take derivatives term by term. That's what it allows you to do. So do you need to split this up for me? No. No, you're not going to do that. What you're going to do is look at this and go, okay, Mr. Leonard said by this, this rule, split up by addition subtraction, that I can split them up. That means I can take derivatives term by term. Since I could pull a constant out, that means I'm just multiplying it. So do I need to show that? No, you don't. It's just saying it's legal to do. That means that when I look at this, I go, oh, okay, I know that constant's going to end up being multiplied by the derivative of x to the ninth. The derivative of x to the ninth is 9x to the eighth. When I multiply the 3 times the 9, that's how I'm getting the 27. This says, okay, minus, but I'm going to have a negative there. Or if you consider this as one term, negative 1 times negative 3, that's going to give you the positive 3. Then the, that x to the negative 4 comes in the fact that I can take this derivative by itself term by term. How many people feel okay with our example so far? Good, okay, cool. Would you like to see one more? Yeah. How about two more? Yeah, sure. yeah we'll, we'll, do, uh, we'll do two more. I'll show you an application of it. Uh, we'll talk about higher order derivatives and that'll be our day. I know higher order derivatives sound much worse, but they're not. They're, you'll like them, I promise. I'm going a little bit beyond this section for a reason. I want to show you that this work, this is actually true. Have we fit our format yet? Have we fit that? No, what's wrong? Square roots are problems for us. Square roots are problems because they don't have an exponent. Can you make them have an exponent? Yes. What is the exponent? Power over root. It's always power over root. So the root is 2, the power is 1, that means x to the 1 half power. So if this becomes a derivative with respect to the variable x, 4 minus 3, x to the 1 half. This is the last time I'll show you how to break it up. You could break this up as a derivative of 4, Minus the derivative, minus, well, I'll even do this for you. Three times the derivative of x to the one half. Do you see how that's legal to split that up? We can split it by subtraction. We can move constants out in front of it. This is a very easy derivative, derivative to take. What's the derivative of a constant number? Yeah. Notice the difference here? This is not connected by a variable, right? This is just the derivative of the constant itself. And I pull that out. Even if I were to do this and say, well, wait a second, Mr. Leonard, did you say I could pull the constant out in front? Did, didn't I tell you that? You still have a 1 in there, right? What's the derivative of 1? One? 1's still a constant. 4 times 0 is still 0. Right? The variable affects your problem. That's what it does. Derivative of a constant gives you just 0. So this is 0. Don't forget that's a minus. Notice that, are you okay, by the way, getting from here to here, separating them and pulling the 3 out at the same time? You have that 3 times, let's do the derivative of a fractional exponent. It works exactly the same way as any other power rule. So, can you bring down the 1 half? So bring that down first. 1 half, x to, x to the, ooh, can you subtract 1 from 1 half? Negative 1 half. Negative 1 half, yeah, 1 half minus 1.
So our derivative is negative 3 halves x to the negative 1 half. Okay. Could you maybe get that directly from here? Could you get that? What happens to the 4? Zero, because it's being it's 4 minus something with a variable. So that's a constant term all by itself. The derivative of a constant term all by itself is zero, yes? Minus, oh, that's our negative. 1 half times 3 is 3 halves. x to the 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half. Can you make it a little prettier? Mm-hmm. If you make it a little prettier, here's how it would look. The negative 3 would be on your numerator. Your denominator would have a 2 from that. This negative exponent would go down to the denominator, and it's also a square root. That's how that thing would look. Negative exponent, bottom. One half, square root. Show of hands, how many feel okay with what we talked about so far? You can do this with any polynomial. Anything with a, an integer in it, uh, or, and now we move on fractional exponents. You can do this with pretty much darn near anything that's broken up into terms. So, that means when you get a problem that looks like this, And I say, OK, <clears throat> 5 x to the 7 minus 3 x to the 4th, 2 x cubed <clears throat> plus x minus 1. Notice the notation I'm going to use here. If I say find dy dx, then my notation might change for the type of function I have. This is defined as y equals, so I have find the derivative of y with respect to its variable of x. That's what that says in English, okay? Can you find the derivative of that? Could you have done it with limits? Yes, you could have. Would it have taken you probably a weekend? Yeah. You'd hate me. Maybe if some of you hated me on some of your homework you were doing. Oh, I don't like you, Mr. Leonard. But now you love me, right? <laughs> totally almost forgiven. <laughs> almost, almost forgiven. <laughs> Can you take a derivative real quick? Yeah, sure. Take it term by term. Do you need to split it up? No, I was showing you those rules to say that you can split it up, which means you can take a derivative term by term through addition subtraction. Do it now. The next question asks one of the fundamental principles of calculus, one of them. And it's, it's so far reaching as far as applications go. If you can answer that question, you can have a, a good foothold about the, the ideas of calculus. So firstly, let me make sure you can actually find a, a derivative. Here I look at this, I'd say, okay, I bring down my exponent. I'm going to have, by the way, dy dx it says the derivative of y with respect to x is, and then you put your derivative. 35x to the 6th. Did you get that? Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to get minus 12x to the 3rd. Yes? Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to get plus 6x squared. Don't forget about the square. Don't forget the exponents. Oh, can't, you can't lose those. Uh, oh, how about the x? One. Why 1? Because I said so. <laughs> because Mr. Lennon said. Well, you can do it by this. this. <coughs> you can do it by the rule. Or you can think that is just a linear function, right? The derivative of a linear function has to be the constant term which is in front of it, which happens to be a 1 in this case. That's going to be 1. If that had been 3x, that would be a 3. What happens to the 1? This one. <coughs> that's a constant that's gone out of your problem. How many of you made it that far? Yes, no, yes. Good, all right, cool. Now, the next one asks this. Can you, can you take this idea and apply it? At what points does y equals x cubed minus 3x plus 4 have horizontal tangent lines? Tell me something about a line 
that is horizontal. What do you know about a line that is horizontal? Slope is how much? Zero. Okay, the slope is zero. You're all right. Horizontal tangent lines have slopes that are zero. You follow? What will give you the slope? We know derivative means slope, right? So the idea is, can you find the derivative and see where it equals zero? Because if you can find the derivative and see where it equals zero, you will have the points at which you have horizontal tangent lines. This, it, you, you will find out uh, that we're going to use this in graphing for finding out the points of relative max and relative min. You ever heard of those things before? We'll be able to do that very quickly. We'll be able to optimize uh, word problems, maximization, minimization, cost functions, all sorts of things with this idea. Find a derivative, set equal to zero. That's going to give you the points that you get a horizontal tangent. We're going to uh, talk about this next time. All right, so one question that we can conquer, uh, according with our, our derivatives and the idea that a derivative is a, what's a derivative again? Uh, okay, glad you're awake today for Tuesday. Congratulations, that's awesome. Uh, we can conquer the idea of, can we find out where functions will have horizontal tangent lines? Firstly, what do you know about a line that is horizontal, something about its slope? Zero. Slope would be zero for a horizontal line, true? So if we were trying to look for lines that are horizontal to our original function, how do you find the slope of the original function? A derivative would give you slope. Yeah, absolutely. So if we found the derivative of our original function, and we found out where that was equal to a slope of 0, then we're going to be able to find the points where we have a horizontal tangent line. Here's how you would do that. Number one, take your derivative of your function. Go ahead and do that now. So do dy dx, or y prime, if you'd like. Take your derivative. Come on, we got this last time. Take your derivative. Derivatives now should be, oh man, this should be really quick. Shoot, if we had to do the limit for this derivative, that'd take forever, right? It wouldn't be that great. But now we can do it in literally like five seconds. Like literally five seconds, it's crazy. Uh, what's the derivative for y equals x cubed minus 3x plus 4? What is that? Great, because I told you you can take it term by term. 3x squared, absolutely, minus how much? What happens to the 4? That's a constant. Derivative is a constant, so it gives you 0 if it's not attached to a variable. Did you get 3x squared minus 3? Okay. What does this give you again? So this right here is your slope. Of that curve. That's the slope of that curve. What I want to know is where this curve has tangent lines which are horizontal. What we found out earlier is that the slope of the tangent line is the slope of the curve at the point. Does that make sense? So if this is the slope of the curve at any point, and we want that slope to be 0, can you set that equal to 0? So if you set this, the idea is we want it to be horizontal, right? Horizontal means a slope of 0. So basically we want a slope a slope of zero. Zero means horizontal. Can you do that for any slope you were looking for? Say if you want a slope where it equals two. Absolutely. So if I want a slope of one, I'd have it equal to one. Probably be harder to solve in this particular case, but you can do it. Yeah, this is a formula for slope. So if we set it equal to whatever we want, now the idea is we're typically going to pick horizontal because interesting things happen when you have a slope equal to zero. That, that, that really does have interesting things. For instance, this. At this point up at the top, notice positive slope, positive slope, positive slope, negative slope, negative slope, negative slope. Do you see that? Therefore, at the top, it has to have a slope of zero. That would be a change from increasing to decrease, and that would give you a relative maximum, sometimes an absolute maximum of your function. So interesting things happen there. Curves are optimized normally when you have some sort of a slope equal to zero. So this is going to be the most common question I'm going to ask of you as far as relate the slope to some number. It's typically, typically going to be zero. you follow the idea? Now can you solve that? Hey, that's just some basic algebra. So if we solved it, how might you solve it? Factor out three and take the squares. You could. You could do factor three, different squares, you're going to get one and negative one. Do you see it? Or if you added three, divided by three and took a square root, 
you'd still have 1 and negative 1. Do you see it either way? So either way, because when you take a square root, you have plus and minus. I like the factoring version. Sure, we get x squared minus 1 equals 0. That's 3 x plus 1, x minus 1. x plus 1 equals 0. x minus 1 equals 0. Therefore, x equals negative 1. x equals positive 1. Hey, do something for me real quick. Just verify this for your own edification here, for your own knowledge. Uh, take those, plug it into that. Take these and plug it into that and see what you get, okay? Just so you see what happens here. Take a negative 1 and plug it in. How much do you get? You get 0. Take 1 and plug it in. How much do you get? So would you agree that these are the points where your slope is going to equal 0? These are the points where you're going to have a horizontal tangent. These are the actually not the points. I misspoke. These are the x values. Can you now find the points at which you will have a horizontal tangent? The points. These are your x values. How do you find points? To this one? No, that gives you slopes. That would give you points. So the points would be at, all right, well, let's see here. If x equals negative 1 and x equals 1, if I plug in negative 1 and I plug in 1, these two points will have horizontal tangent lines. Plug in negative 1, how much do you get out of that? 6? Okay. Plug in positive 1, how much do you get out of that? Those right there are the two points where you will have horizontal tangent lines. Nowhere else. That's it. I can say for certain nowhere else because we have found the function for the slope. We set it equal to zero and we solved it. And these are the only two points that existed. That's it. How many people understood the idea of a horizontal tangent? It's kind of interesting, right? Yeah, cool. You know, last thing in our section really is we can also talk about higher derivatives. We've been taking first derivatives this whole time, which means you take the derivative of the function and that's it. Right now, we're going to I'm going to tell you that you can take a second derivative and a third derivative and as many as you want to take. So we're going to look at higher derivatives. <coughs> I do need to tell you the notation, though. How we say, how we write out a first and a second and a third and a fourth. So here's a first derivative, second derivative, we'll talk about a third. And you can go further and further and further, however many want derivatives you want to take. Our notation for a first derivative was typically this f prime of x, you remember that one, right? Or we'd have uh, y prime, you can write y prime or dy dx. Those are the, the main three. We stick with those normally. Actually, in this class, we'll be sticking with this one, and that one typically is where we, where we like to go. You are with that so far? That should be like old school stuff. Well, not old school. It's all new for you, but like from the, uh, the previous section. So we have that. Second derivative say this. You take your first derivative, then you take a derivative of that. So for instance, could you take a derivative of this? Yeah, it would be pretty easy. You'd get how much? you get 6x. Very good. That would be called a second derivative. Second derivatives are notated this way. So this is the f prime of x. You'd say f double prime of x. If I took another derivative, I'd have f triple prime of x. And you just keep on writing little dash marks. Uh, some people I've, I've seen put a little 4 up there for fourth derivative. I know we rarely get to a fourth derivative, but you could. Uh, you, but you keep on writing those little dash marks. This is called the, the Newtonian method of, of writing um, derivatives. But you see, there's these two guys, uh, Isaac Newton and Sir Godfrey Leibniz, who invented calculus about the same time. One of them was English. I think Newton was English, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And then uh, Leibniz was German. And of course, back then, the nations want to say, well, we invented calculus. This is ours. And so they kind of stuck with their own notation. And, and uh, this, this right here is the, 
Newton's way of doing it, he used little dots. And this is the Leibniz way of doing it. And we still have that notation to this day. So this comes from the, the German guy and this comes from the English guy. Uh, how they notated it and we still use that. And each of them have their advantages. Um, this one, I'll show you some advantages to this later on, why it's kind of nice and why I do it this way. Uh, first, because my German heritage, you know, but then, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, because we actually can do some pretty cool things with this type of notation, I'll show you that, especially when we get to like differential equations, things like that. All right, um, now Y prime, you'd still stick with the Y double prime, Y triple prime, and so on. Uh, the dy dx does this, a little bit different. It says, okay, this is a first derivative of Y with respect to X. Okay, one time. This says, take a second derivative of y with respect to x both times. That's how I think of it. So you have a little 2 saying that's a second derivative. This is a third derivative with respect to x every time. So we keep on putting on another number. That's a little bit more concise than those, those little dash marks. I like that a little bit better. It looks better. You can see it more. Have like, also, if you're going through and you just, oh, lost one, well, that would suck, right? Because you don't know. But it's hard to screw up a 2 and a 3. Well, maybe not. Maybe not that hard. But harder than messing up a dash mark. Are you guys OK with the, the derivative notation? First, second, third? What I'd like to do now, just for fun, can you find All of the higher derivatives of this. Can you find all the higher derivatives there? So start with the first derivative. Find the first derivative. Then find the second one. Then the third one then the fourth one, then the fifth one, then the sixth one, and see what happens, okay? I want you to keep going. Did you find them? Are you still working on it? Still working on it? Keep going. If not, well, let's start up here. First derivative, can you please tell me what the first derivative is on this? Mm -hmm. 20x cubed. You got that one, right? Okay, then I, I heard 27x squared, yes, minus 10x. 9x squared. What is it? Oh, 27. I actually cubed it. My bad. I was on this one. Shoot. I guess 3 times 3 is 9. That's, that's good to know. Yeah. Uh, and lastly, what else do we have? Yeah, my bad. What happens with 347? What? Here's what's interesting, too. What if I did made this 34,755? Would this derivative change? No. So that constant really has no effect on your derivative. We're talking about the slope, right? So all this is is really a shift upward or downward. So if we're just shifting the whole function up or down, it doesn't affect the slope of the function. It says, oh, now it's way up here, now it's way down here. So that really doesn't affect it, which is interesting. Okay, uh, next up, second derivative. We just take the derivative again. So we're going to do, uh, oh, what's 28 times 3? What do you get? x squared minus 18x, you got that one right, minus 10. What happens to the 9? It's a constant. It goes away. Now what? Okay. Then we take the derivative again, and yeah, we're going to get 168, and again, that, that constant goes away, 168. Well, let's do the fifth derivative. What's the fifth, what's the derivative of 168? 
What's the sixth derivative? Zero. What's the seventh derivative? Zero. What's every derivative after that? Zero. This is going to happen for every polynomial. You see, at some point, no matter what you start with, if it's a polynomial, you'll be able to take a derivative, and what happens every time is the, the, the order of the polynomial decreases by one. So 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, and then a constant. So that's going to happen with polynomials. Now, does it happen all the time? Think about something that's not a polynomial. I'll give you an example if you need one. How about that? Well, decreasing, because we subtract one, but it becomes more and more and more negative, right? This derivative would, the derivative of that would give you negative two, x to the negative three, right? Then you get positive six, x to the negative four, and then so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so that actually, that, that exponent keeps on getting smaller, more and more and more negative. So this won't cycle out to zero eventually, it's not a polynomial. So be careful on it, you're not always going to go to zero, but you can find more and more and more derivatives on this. How many people feel okay with our higher order derivatives? So it's basically just take a derivative and then take it again and again and again. That's what this is asking you to do. So where would we be the correct place to stop at 168 or when it reaches zero? Zero. Okay, so this is all the higher derivatives because every other derivative is going to be zero. So zero counts as a derivative. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, this, we've taken one, two, 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 three, four, but then you could take this again and get something different, five. right? You could get five. But then as soon as you take it, six, it's not doing, you can take them as many times as you want. You're just going to get the trivial answer of zero after that. Yes? What if it was 1 over x squared? That is 1 over x squared. But when you get to 0? No. No. Uh, the derivative of this. Is in no way 1 over 2x. At all. You're breaking the rules here. There's only one rule that we have. The one rule that we have is it must fit this format, folks. It must fit this format. If it doesn't fit that format, you can't do it. That's it. You need to be able to break it down in such a way that it does fit this format. All we can do is separate by addition subtraction and pull out constants. So in order to make it fit this format, we can't just say, oh, derivative of x squared is 2x. That would be awesome, but no, it doesn't work that way. Instead, you have to say, oh, this is the derivative of x to the negative 2. That fits that format. Do you see the difference there? You have to make it fit that. So you have to pull that negative, that exponent up and make it a negative. That way you can work with your power rule. Does that clarify your question? Okay, so we can't just take derivatives of parts of like quotients. You can't take it of parts of products. We're going to talk about those things in just a little while, but you can't just do that. Are you with me on this? Would you like to see one more example? It might be good for you guys to see this one. Take the derivative of all those things. Mm -hmm. Could you take the derivative of this thing? Got your head. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Can you take a derivative altogether? <clears throat> no, not the way it is right now. Let me show you a couple things about this problem. Number one, well, you probably are going to want to make this x to the fifth minus 2x minus 3 all over 3x to the 1 half. Do you see what we did there? You okay with that? That's okay. That's great. That's fine. But here's what you cannot do. This is going to go back to our previous problem. What you can't do, folks, you can't do this. I wish you could, but you can't. You can't go, oh, you know what? This is 5x to the 4th minus 2x over 3 halves x to the negative 1 half. Do you see what I did? I took derivative, 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 derivative. Can you do that? No. No, you can't. They're, they're connected. They're in, they're in a quotient. We're going to find out later. You can't do that. You can't do that one. If you want to write that down, cross it out. If you wrote it down, cross it out. You can't just take it piece by piece if they're connected. You have to be able to separate them completely and take a derivative 
uh, but term by term. You can't do that here. You see, you can't separate this and have its own derivative, minus its own derivative, minus its own derivative, and then have it over another derivative. That's something we can't do. We can't do that. So what we would have, oh, give me another option. What could I do? Whenever I have some expression over one single term, what could I do? I can't move that up. I don't want to do that. What can I do when I, whenever I have one ex, uh, several express, several terms over one single factor? Split once it up. Time. What now? Split it up over the. Let's split it up. So sometimes these these daunting looking uh, derivatives that you need to do. What would happen if I did split this up as x to the fifth over this minus two x over this three over that? Let's see what happens there. Then maybe we'll make it fit into our, our scenario that we can work with. Firstly, are you okay that this doesn't work, as a matter of fact? You can't just take all these pieces if we have a quotient or a product or something crazy. The only time we ever found out that that did work was this, look. When I had a polynomial, yes, that works. Because I can separate by addition subtraction, that's what makes that work. I didn't tell you you can separate by division because you can't. I didn't tell you you can separate by multiplication because you can't unless you have the constant that comes out. It's only, that's the only thing. So you can't separate by division. You can't do that. Only thing you can separate is addition and subtraction. You follow me on this? So when I, when I translate this into 3x to the 1 half, we've got to have something better than this, this, this over that. That doesn't work. What we could do is potentially split these up into three different fractions. So for instance, why don't we try to make it x to the fifth over 3x to the 1 half? minus 2x <coughs> over 3x to the 1 half, minus 3 over 3x to the 1 half. And then we'll try to simplify each of those fractions to make them fit in our power rule, and then take the derivative. Are you guys all right with what we're doing so far? We're trying to make it fit into this. We have to make it fit there. If we can't make it fit there, we can't take the derivative right now. Can you combine those? x to the fifth and x to the one half. How do you combine those? Make it three x to the negative half. Okay. What happens when you have common bases that are being divided? Do you add exponents, subtract exponents, multiply exponents, or divide exponents? Let me let me break it down even easier for you. Okay. Watch. No, just watch. <laughs> there. Can you simplify that? Please, goodness, say yes. Please say yes, Mr. Leonard. I know how to, I'm, a, I'm supposed to be in this class. Yay. How do you simplify this? What is it? What is it? You subtract what? You subtract your exponents. Because when you divide exponents, you have four of them here. You have three of them there. You cross out three of them, you have one of them left, right? That's subtracting exponents. You go, oh, yes. This is completely gone. That becomes an x. What happens to the two? Go on the top, stay on the bottom. So you would have x over two. True? Or you could get one half x. Do you follow? Okay. So you know whenever you have common bases, you subtract exponents. This is not a hard concept. You've seen this since your algebra, beginning algebra days. Beginning algebra days. So can you combine these? The answer is what? How do you combine those? How do you, how do you combine those? Subtract what? Subtract your exponents. What's five? Minus a half. How much are you going to get? Nine. Four and a half. Give it to me as an improper fraction. Nine halves. Nine halves. Really? All right. I didn't do it in my head. Yeah, nine halves. I need you to be able to get there. That's not calculus. Okay, that's algebra. This right here, I mean, people have said before, you take calculus to finally fail algebra. Don't let that be you. Know your algebra. If you know your algebra, this is a piece of cake. I mean, really, honestly, calculus is easy if you know your algebra. I promise. And trigonometry. If you don't, yeah, it's going to hold you back a lot. Uh, are you okay on, firstly, going from here to here? Secondly, going from here to splitting them up? And now thirdly, do you see how to get from the x to the fifth over x to the one half into one third x to the nine halves? We're subtracting those two exponents, do that in calculate if you want to, five minus a half, you're gonna get four and a half or nine halves. Minus. 
Let's look at those numbers. That's going to give me two-thirds. X over X to the one-half gives you what, please? One-half. One-half, good, because you subtract one minus one-half and get X to the one-half. Minus, oh, what's that become? This is supposed to be a new video. You have that old school ringtone on? Come on, man. <laughs> Give me some 50 cent or something. Oh, that's even old, too. <laughs> What's new? Uh, I'm on the edge of glory. <laughs> Give me that one next time, okay? All right, thanks. What happens to the threes? They become a one. What happens to the x to the one half? What are you going to have to do with that in order to make it fit that? What do you do? Can you leave it like this and take a derivative? No. Nope. Mm -hmm. That would be the scenario. Mm -hmm. That would be that scenario. What do you have to do to the one half? Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to move that to the numerator and make it a negative one half. Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. You're constantly trying to make it just look like that. That's what you need. So one over x to the one half? No. X to the negative one half? Yes. Yes. Show of hands, how many people feel okay with this so far? Simple algebra, good, all right, simple. you passed simple algebra. Very good. Hey, now that y, this is still y, I haven't even done, do you notice I haven't even done calculus yet? No calculus yet, this is basic, this is algebra. Now can you do the calculus, can you take a derivative? Why don't you carefully, right now, take me that derivative? Go ahead and do that, carefully take the derivative. I'd rather have the, Go slowly on it, by the way. I, I want the correct answer slowly rather than the wrong answer quickly. That would be stupid. Was that Lady Goo Goo, by the way? Hmm. That lady? Yeah. Is that not right? That was perfect. Spot on. <laughs> So dy dx or y prime if you'd like. Note how each of these now fits into our format here. The constants, we could pull them out. We're just taking a derivative of x to the 9 halves, derivative of x to the 1 half, derivative of x to the negative 1 half. Let's do that piece by piece. I'm going to show you every step, okay, right now, so you see where it's coming from. I'll have the 1 third times the 9 halves. You see where the 9 halves is coming from, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, I'm going to have x to the, I need to do 9 halves minus 1, that's going to give me 7 halves. Did you get 7 halves as well? Perfect, 7 halves. Get that one? Next up, I'm going to have minus, minus, 2 thirds, 2 thirds. Times what, folks? Okay. What one half? Because that's my exponent that I'm bringing down. So I leave my constant alone. I'm multiplying by my exponent, and then I'm going to take x to the one half minus one gives you what? <laughs> Lastly, I have minus minus. What now? Okay, negative one half. Okay, great. So. Negative one half. I'm going to put that in parentheses saying, hey, I'm a negative, watch out. I have a negative there. So minus is minus. Negative, that's our negative. X to the, okay, X to the, what am I going to get? Negative three halves. Because I negative one and a half or negative three halves, right? We use improper fractions here because they're easier to deal with. So negative one half minus one gives you negative three halves. You got that one? Show of hands, how many would feel okay with getting that far on our problem? Right. <coughs> Let's make it a little bit prettier. Simplify some fractions. That's one. That's two. There's a third one. In the most basic sense, that's your derivative. No problem. What is that? What did I just find? What is that that we found? 
Oh, come on, what is it? What's the derivative? Slope of, point. Point. slope of a curve. curve. curve at a now, the slope of this curve, this weird curve, at any point. It's kind of neat that we're able to find that, right? We don't even know what the <coughs> curve looks like. Yet we're able to find the slope of that at any point. We have a function for it. Now, if you do want to make this a little bit nicer looking, you can translate these back into roots if you really so desire. Um, you could do, well, I probably wouldn't change that one at all, unless you want to do it. Square root of x to the seventh, that's what that means. So if you really are forced to do it, here's how you would change this back into roots. For me, most of the time that's going to be fine, but if you're forced to plug numbers in, you want to see what's actually going on here. So this would be 3 square root x to the seventh over 2. Minus, since that's a negative, it will be on the denominator of fraction, 3 square root of x. Since that's a negative exponent, it will be on the denominator of a fraction along with that 2, a square root of x cubed. That's the way you would write that without any negative exponents associated with them. Most of the time we're going to be okay on that. However, typically if they get root form, you want to make it back into root form. So in that case, that would be maybe what you see in the back of your book or, or, uh, or some other context. Some people feel okay with our example up here. So, can we do this term by term by term by term? Can we do that? No, we cannot separate division. We can't do that. What we can do is separate our fraction first hand, firstly, then simplify each of those, and then take a derivative. That's something we can do. And that it's not too bad. It deals with a lot of fractions here, but I mean, that's some algebra. We should be okay with our fractions. Are there any questions before we move on at all? Do you like these derivative business? Can you imagine taking the limit of that? Of x plus h? Ooh, good thing we had that. Seriously? <laughs> I'm on the end. <laughs> 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 <laughs>